The 17th century is not just the age of science, that's a truism, of course. It's the age of Isaac Newton, who, by the lights of the 18th century, was a veritable icon, a veritable saint of science. The Newtonian achievement was at once a source of inspiration and confidence. And given his accomplishments and the methods that generated them, well, the sky's the limit. And the first thing that the 18th century was prepared to defend in coming to that conclusion is that Newton's methods were utterly secular, forward-looking, analytically rigorous, true of the true scientist, one not in the thrall of ancient wisdom, not caught up in scholastic niceties. Conveniently overlooked in the propaganda wars of the Enlightenment is the fact that the idolized, the utterly idolized Newton was rather more interested in scripture and the teachings of the Christian church than in the laws of gravity. Now, let me just uh, pause for a moment and, and, and um, underscore this point. To hear the 18th century tell it, Newton is this utterly secularized intelligence, utterly disabusing himself of all antique notions, not to mention the hocus-pocus and mumbo-jumbo of religious orthodoxy. That's good Enlightenment propaganda. The actual real Newton, who lived and, and worked on planet Earth, was profoundly interested in Scripture all the days of his life. The prophetic promises of, uh, of Francis Bacon did seem to be fully redeemed by Newton and his experimental undertakings. Newton conducted many experiments, some so significant as to ground the very laws of the universe. He advanced incredibly original theories. He developed novel instruments and created whole methods of mathematical analysis that astounded his age. Beyond the contributions to science, however, Newton, in virtue of his very life and character, served as a model for succeeding generations of scientists. He was born in 1642 in Woolsthorpe, Lincolnshire, and he died in London in 1727, remarkably productive over most of those 84 years, including some of the earliest. His father had died months before his own birth. A prosperous but illiterate farmer, that's what his farmer did, when he was two years old, his mother remarried and sent him to live with his grandmother, a biographical fact quite similar to Descartes, by the way. I'm not suggesting this is a mode of child-rearing, but it, it, it is a, at least a coincidence. He had no use for his stepfather, and apparently the feeling was fully reciprocated. At 19, Newton confessed that had her had he had his way, his mother and her husband's house would have been set ablaze, and in fact they would have been as well. So this was a fellow quite bitter at 19. And at school he made no positive impression whatever. He was described by his teachers in a way that today would match up with an attention deficit syndrome. I, I can see Newton today on Ritalin. Fortunately for the history of science, Isaac was spotted by his uncle, William Ayscuff, as a candidate for further study. His influence succeeded in having Newton finish preparatory studies in Grantham at 18, and then of all things, with coaching and with a sudden thirst for learning itself, actually getting himself admitted to Cambridge and to Uncle William's own college, Trinity College. Trinity College, Cambridge, June 5th, 1661. To this point, however, he seemed gifted at all only in his tinkering with machinery. He was a, he was a bit of a, well, I think the term today might be a geek, you know. He, he had these sort of geekish tendencies, but certainly nothing predictive of what would culminate as Isaac Newton. Now, staples in the curriculum at Cambridge then were Plato and Aristotle, various books in law and theology. We know he read Descartes and Hobbes, Kepler and Galileo. A book or diary he composed at this time was called Certain Philosophical Questions, beginning the work with a boyishly innocent um, passage. Quote, Plato is my friend, Aristotle is my friend, but my best friend is truth, close quote. 
There is evidence to suggest that his interest in mathematics actually began by way of, ready for this, astrology, a subject he retained an interest in throughout his life. Notwithstanding his lackluster preparation, he is soon able to absorb the subtlest precepts in mathematics as if he had discovered them himself. Now I want to stop here for a second to say um, this prodigious mind in the history of mathematics, Isaac Newton, how does he get interested in mathematics? It's, he finds some things going on in astrology that require a comprehension of mathematics. So he sets his mind to mathematics. Had he not had an interest in astrology, the fellow might have spent all of his life making clocks or something. Now, in some instances, Newton, having mastered a proof, would proceed to invent another and better one, and do this at the ripe old age of 21. An outbreak of plague in 1665 caused the suspension of studies at Cambridge, Newton returning home, and miraculously proceeding to produce some of the most original scientific and mathematical discoveries in the history of science. Always reluctant to publish, Newton would have many of his achievements well known to intimate friends years and even decades before he, he gave any publicity to them whatever. But when he returned to Cambridge in 1667 and his discoveries came to the attention of the leading mathematics don there, I refer to Isaac Barrow, it was Barrow who proceeded to make these works of genius known in all the right places. In fact, in order to secure Newton the position and the perks needed for so great a mind, this wonderful Don, Barrow, resigned his own Lucasian chair in mathematics so that Newton, at 27 years of age, could sit as Lucasian professor of mathematics. Don't ever underestimate the great teacher. He wrote down in his Reguli Philosophandi these rules for conducting philosophy, the rules for philosophizing, just the way one should go about doing scientific work. These hold up very well. They're still exemplary. Scientists to this day, particularly in the developed branches of science, if they don't cite Newton, certainly mimic or at least follow in the tradition established in these writings and in Newton's great Principia the Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. This was published in 1687, Newton now 45 years old, honored, revered, and with the publication of this work, recognized as the scientist of the age. Now let me cite a few of the contributions that he sets forth in this great work. Newton formulates the law of universal gravitation. Now that would be enough to earn a a lasting reputation. He provides mathematical solutions to problems involving the motion of bodies. He shows how to quantify the density of the earth, the trajectory of comets, the mass of the sun. He explains the motion of the tides. He develops and names the concepts of centripetal force by which an object could in principle be made to do what? orbit the earth. There's always the temptation, especially in examining the lives of scientists, to see in such achievements a continuation of traditions already long in place. And it is sometimes written, even by admirers of Newton, that after all he had the discoveries of Kepler and Galileo and Copernicus. Didn't Newton himself say that, quote, if I have seen further than other men, it's only because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Indeed. But Newton ushered in a revolutionary perspective in science, and that revolution can't be explained merely as his continuing work in progress. The term revolution is overused. We're told we've had a Freudian revolution, and Kant introduced a Copernican revolution in philosophy. We're now in the midst of a genetic revolution. But you see, Newton really did usher in a revolutionary change in method, in the understanding of science, and in the very attitude we have about ourselves as knowledge-gathering, theory-testing entities capable of placing the physical world almost where we want it, controlling it, having it do our bidding. 
Newton is the first not only to develop a new method in mathematics, he shares with Leibniz the discovery of calculus. But I say he not only develops, he not only invents and discovers the calculus of fluxions, but does so for the express purpose of solving problems in physics. That is, he is the one who mathematizes the agenda of the physical sciences. Mathematics now, as an applied, not just an abstract undertaking, but an applied method for dealing with problems in astronomy and dynamics. This is a revolutionary application of mathematics, not found in the work of Kepler or Copernicus. I want to stress this point. This now is mathematics as a mode of discovery. Descartes was an original thinker in mathematics, but unlike Newton, his works in natural philosophy, with just a few negligible exceptions, are absolutely devoid of mathematics. So here you've got someone like Kepler himself, very, very skillful in mathematics, and more than Kepler, entirely imaginative and creative in mathematics, but still not seeing the relationship we now know to obtain between mathematics and physics, mathematics and the physical sciences. This all seems quite obvious now. It is obvious, and it's obvious because of Newton. It was not obvious in 1600. It certainly wasn't obvious to Francis Bacon. It certainly wasn't obvious to Descartes 50 years later. And it's Newton who makes it obvious. That's the habit of genius. It makes obvious what had never been thought of before. When we consult Kepler on the laws of motion, we find Kepler insisting that motion will cease when force is no longer applied. Now this is the theory precisely replaced and defeated by Newton's laws of motion. Again, Newton's achievement is different from building on a past. It is correcting the past in such a way as to alter the future course of entire realms of inquiry. Central to Newton's laws of motion are propositions that were explicitly denied by Kepler in his own major scientific works. I can't dilate on these, but I can, as it were, rush through them a bit. Consider Kepler's laws of planetary motion to see how Newton's mind operates. Kepler's laws are precise laws, and the observational data of Tycho Brahe fit into the laws nicely. Newton seeks to understand all this. Now what is his approach? Test this carefully. First, he reduces the problem. He renders the problem in utterly abstract terms. He reduces the problem to the problem of an ideal mass, a point revolving around a center of force. No need to look at planets or peer through telescopes. Rather, one can sit with a pencil and a piece of paper, in this case, let's say, a quill and a piece of paper, and determine the behavior of an ideal mass making revolutions around a center of force. Now, this becomes an idealized model of an imaginable world, a possible world. When he reduces the problem that way, he then solves the equations and shows that although Kepler's laws actually don't work at the level of observation, and they don't, they do work at the level of the ideal representation of the problem. Now the reason I, I do want to dilate on, on, on this reduction of the Keplerian problem to that of an ideal mass going around a center of force is to note that this actually becomes a model of representing complex problems at large. An idealized model of an imaginable world can be used to frame and test conjectures regarding the facts of the actual world. Newton is important in introducing into the methodology of science the role of the model, the idealized model, and that approach now guides virtually every branch of systematic knowledge. Here is Newton, four centuries ago, concretely idealizing a complex problem in astronomy, solving at the level of this idealized abstraction, and returning now to the database and seeing the extent to which the ideal solution and the observational data match up with each other. This, I say, is 
paradigmatic of theoretical and applied science, hand in glove, at their best. Now, only in the ideal world of mathematics do Kepler's laws hold up. In the world of actual physical things, there are always discrepancies. So Newton now must distinguish between truth and approximations. You now have an ideal standard by which you can gauge the adequacy of the empirical data, the adequacy of theories constructed at the level of observation. This relationship between the ideal model as a test of theories and progress in science, this connection, this fundamental Newtonian connection, becomes a central feature in the progress of science to this day. So if I might repeat myself, Newton in all these respects is not simply building on some earlier tradition. This is the novel, creative power of a mind of genius and recognized as such. A final point here. Galileo, of course, is a much better candidate for the honor of establishing the two new sciences which might be seen as anticipating own, uh, Newton's own methods. I say if you wanted to say Newton was building on anybody's work, it would be Galileo's. But Galileo, whose pioneering research in mechanics is legendary and indeed foundational for the science that would, for, that would follow, still leaves no possibility, for example, for the tides to be influenced by the moon. Now this may sound like a small omission, but it is in fact integral to the correct universal law of gravitation. At least here, Galileo is not a forerunner of Newton's. Now more accessible than his great Principia, Newton's treatise in optics was published in English in 1704, and it concludes with a collection of the most intriguing scientific questions imaginable at the time, or at any time. Einstein, by the way, would, would have an interest in this one. We're talking about something appearing in a treatise on optics. Quote, Do not bodies act upon light at a distance and by their action bend its rays? Close quote. We remain very interested in this one. Quote, what is there in places empty of matter? Whence is it that the sun and planets gravitate toward one another without dense matter between them? Close quote. Indeed, what about this action at a distance with nothing in between? It's doubtful that Newton had more than a casual interest in astrology, but he did have more than a casual interest in alchemy. He is not shunning some of the natural magic, natural science dimensions of late Renaissance scientific thought, including Hermeticism. His unpublished work includes hundreds of pages devoted to alchemical theory and to alchemical research. In one recent biography, uh, it bears the suggestive title, Newton, The Last Sorcerer, a fine book by Michael White. The last sorcerer. Well, a man of great complexity, Newton never lost faith in the central proposition that the harmony and lawfulness discovered as a result of his own genius and the genius of science was a reflection of God's plan for the universe. I want to make clear that the Newton we're talking about is a God-fearing Christian man, a lifelong student of the Bible keenly interested in the prophets of the Old Testament, committing perhaps as many lines to these subjects as to science itself. And I say, it, it is worth noting at this point that although this is distinctive in Newton, it, it's not unique in Newton. There, there isn't some fundamental rift now between a God-fearing Christian person, etc., university don, engaged in research, higher mathematics, so forth, uh, at the same time being profoundly interested in the Bible and, and seeing in these activities a certain uh, mutual compatibility and complementarity. Back to Newton, the person. He had several periods of very deep depression in life, the worst being in 1693, occasioned perhaps by the end of a valued relationship 
with a young Swiss mathematician named Fatio. It was at the same time that Newton's religious sensibilities were undergoing some upheaval, and also a time when he may have reacted to toxins produced by his alchemical research. For a time, he turned on his friends. He was rarely seen leaving his rooms. Mathematics problems may well have lifted the clouds. Newton is an icon, but he's also the representative of an age. He is a figure in the 17th century. The 17th century is a time of great foment in which one king will lose his head. It's the century of Cromwell and the roundheads and leveling and a kind of puritanical conservatism. It's also a century that will see the restoration of the monarchy. With Charles II, there's a certain upbeat, forward-looking, positivistic, progressive attitude. Science is an important part of life in this world. This is a world on the move with expansion of trade routes, colonies growing in the new world, and a host of practical problems to be solved. The need for technical and scientific minds to solve such problems results in the happy marriage of the monarchy and the inquisitive. And thus in 1660 there is formed under royal charter the Royal Society of, the Royal Society of London and its motto, Nullius in Verba, on the authority of no one's words. What counts here is not the revealed truth of Scripture or what the king says or the productions of the wise man. The Royal Society of London, devoted to the discovery of useful knowledge using the methods of science. Newton, as it happens, will be one of its presidents, succeeding Robert Hooke and adding luster to a congress of inquiring minds that will come to include the greatest figures in the modern history of science. Let me say a few words about the Royal Society, about what it symbolizes, less about what it actually accomplished. Within a few years of its founding, the Royal Society begins to compile letters and manuscripts from all over the world. We will find in the unpublished papers of the Royal Society requests by the Crown uh, to inquire into a claim that a woman has given birth to a sheep. Now, mind you, no one at court would give credence to such a claim, but that isn't the point I want to make now. The point is that 30 years earlier, a claim like that would have resulted in a detachment of clergymen. Now, however, before the 17th century has ended, it is science that is to settle such matters. The authority of science is now already and widely accepted. Not just thanks to Newton, this is the age of Newton, but it's the age of Galileo, and yes, Robert Hooke, and Robert Boyle, and Christian Huygens, and Christopher Wren. The list is a very long one. The smarter heads at this point are betting on science. When confronting some epistemological conundrum, some great technical difficulty, when you have to determine the draft of a ship, or longitude at sea, or the best trade route, or whether a woman has given birth to a sheep, or how to prevent scurvy, or what to do about the stone. I say, when these questions of life and limb and commerce and economy and politics and society surface, it's now increasingly common to look to the community of scientists and say either softly or loudly, as a command or a supplication, help. The age of Newton had launched the age of science itself. Well, are we the children of that age? You can answer that question by asking yourself a few questions. What do we do when we come up with a fundamental problem in economics? Child rearing, marital relations, nutrition, problems of aging, insurance settlements, mentally unstable people, international tensions, war and peace. What do we do? Well, we turn on the telly and we wait to hear the latest from the denizens of think tanks with PhDs and master's degrees and the like. 
That is to say, we round up the usual suspects, all trailing advanced degrees, all having specialized in arcane and elusive subjects. Now you might ask, when did all this begin? Of course the temptation is to say, well the great achievements of science being what they are, we now have developed uh, highly specialized knowledge that was mastered by people educated and trained in those subjects and prepared to address these problems, indeed all problems. The plain fact, however, is that no truly consequential social, moral, or political problem, let alone those at the interpersonal level, has ever been solved within specialties that grant PhDs. But an ethos has arisen according to which no problem is a real problem unless it admits of a solution reached by some specialized mode of attack. This is an extraordinary perspective. The idea that if a problem is a bona fide problem, it is solvable by some sort of formulaic method or measurement. In fact, one expression of this, which comes long after Newton, one expression of this takes the following form. If a thing exists, it exists in some degree. If it exists in some degree, it is measurable. The, the whole point being that what resists measurement or falls beyond the ambit of measurement isn't even real. Well, it's the age of Newton. It's the scientific worldview that has shaped and guided this perspective and fostered an optimism that is bound to be frustrated. It was a new idea in the world, this notion of breaking complex problems down into manageable elements and dealing with the pieces. This notion that all reality can be reduced to a model, an ideal model. It's an idea that continues to shape thought in the present world. We don't look for miracles anymore, we look for models, we look for simplifications. We look for quantified expressions of life's challenges. After all, if the universe itself can be understood in mechanical terms, why should puny little societies be any different? I think at this point I might want to remind myself, as I, as, as, as I do often in lectures on this subject, of a, of a line from Voltaire. It would be very odd that all of the planets would conform to fixed and eternal laws and that there should be a little creature five feet tall acting solely according to his own caprice. Here's Voltaire, one of the greatest of, of Newton's admirers. Do you see that here we have these cosmic laws fixing the behavior of the planets. Do you think we're exempt from the same sort of thing? Well, perhaps as a corrective here, one might consider a rather ancient Greek understanding of matters of this sort. What makes a problem a significant human problem and social problem is precisely what does not allow it to be broken down into smaller parts because a problem is not a collection of parts. It's something that begins beyond the reach and the ken of man, something tied up with fate and accident and what was never planned. What one has to learn then, what one has to learn to do is recognize that life becomes possible only within a range of possibilities limited by problems and under the weight of problems. And anything done by way of breaking things down into smaller pieces or reducing it is likely to render it less accessible even to the limited means available to us. The point here is that by lights so apparent to the ancient Greek thinkers, some problems are simply intrinsic to the very life and nature of humanity itself. And so the right task is not to look for a solution or an expert, but to look around for an accommodation. This is a possibility sometimes obscured by the success of science, which in distracting us moves the accommodation even further from our reach. Science is a great gift, and like all great gifts, like all boxes of good candy, too much actually can result in untoward consequences.